Hello and welcome to Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany. This is lecture four, where we try to answer the question, how do you sample a fossil population? So before we kind of talk about fossils, let's define a few terms, um, in particular the term population. So populations in biology are basically a group of individuals living close together and interbreeding. So a population represents a single gene pool with interbreeding across that population. You basically have a group of individuals uh, living together and having the potential of interbreeding with each other. And so gene flow between each of the individuals is unimpeded in a population. Sometimes there can be barriers that develop between populations. So a barrier could come up like a mountain range or something like that or a river and isolate the two populations and therefore restrict gene flow from one population to another population. And these barriers are oftentimes the key to the origin of species. So one of the things that um, evolution has shown us is that geographic isolation of populations is one of the key mechanisms to actually produce new species. And there's different types of speciation that is uh, present in the natural world. So there's allopatric, peripatric, parapatric, and sympatric um, sort of isolation. So let's look at each one of these. Um, this is a figure from Wikipedia. So the first one is you have the original population. It's exposed across a big geographic area. These could be any sort of organisms, but they're interbreeding with each other. So there's gene flow across here. So the interbreeding happening within that population over a large geographic area. But then let's say you have some sort of barrier. So in allopatric speciation, there's a barrier that forms that prevents gene flow from one side of that population to the other side of the population. Over time, each of those populations are subjected to different types of natural selection, and they start to change, and that's depicted by a change from one of the populations from green to yellow. And then what can happen is that barrier basically gets knocked down if it's a river or something like that, and the two populations come back together. But now they are morphologically different or genetically different enough that they don't recognize each other as the same sort of species and they don't interbreed. And this is one of the ways that you can actually produce uh, new species is in isolating populations. In parapatric populations, you have a group that kind of leaves, a population that leaves and becomes isolated and then is reintroduced. And parapatric is where you have a population that sort of has a bottleneck. It's adjacent to the other population, and it may be subjected to different types of selection. You know, if that gene flow starts to get restricted enough, then you can have a butted off new population that turns into a new species in that geographic region. Sympatric is very rare, um, and many of the cases that have been brought forth for sympatric um, evolution um, happening in a, in a population, that means that the population suddenly internally in the same geographic area start to recognize each other as something different and it happens together is extremely rare and hotly debated whether there is any case of sympatric evolution um, that's occurred in the past. So most of the time it's going to be allopatric or parapatric sort of speciation events where you get a geographic isolated population that changes somehow over time and then is reintroduced over a broader geographic area and now you have two species, whereas before you only had one species in one population. So as paleontologists, we're really interested in documenting um, populations and variation within those populations. And we're interested in seeing how those populations change through time. Because one of the advantages of paleontology over biology is that we have enormous amounts of time that we can look at how things change over time. And so one of the things we're really interested in is looking at the variation of a population and how that variation changes over time. And if there are certain things like natural selection that are operating on that population to change it in some way, in some parameter, its shape, its color, <laughs> whatever that we're looking at, the parameters we're looking at. So there's different types of variation within the population, obviously. Uh, in the previous lecture, we talked about ontogenetic differences. Those are differences based on 
um, the lifespan of each of the individuals, so young and old, and they can go through enormous types of differences based on the age. The other thing that can happen is genetic differences in a population. Uh, the most common one is, for example, sexual dimorphism. So these are where there's differences between males and females. And I give you a quick little example of, of a crab down here. Um, the blue crabs where you see the female looks different than the male, they even have different color um, pinchers. Um, and so there's lots of examples of sexual dimorphism, even in humans and, and um, mammals. We see sexual dimorphism between um, women and men and boys and girls. So those are features that you got to account for. And so one of the things you look for is, is whether the presence or absence of sexual dimorphism. Some groups have incredible sexual dimorphism. Other groups have very little sexual dimorphism. So one of the other things you want to look for is genetic variation. Uh, so genetic variation is just the variation in a population. So obviously eye color is a good example. So there's some individuals who have different types of different colors of eyes. Um, and different appearances, and that's just the individual variation in a, in, in a population. So variation could be continuous or it can be discontinuous. Here's an example of a species of butterfly uh, exhibiting different types of individual variation within a population. Those, that genetic variation is really important because that's how natural selection is going to operate on the population. So genetic variation in a population, uh, each individual is unique in special ways, and that's what we're kind of interested in trying to capture when we measure lots of specimens and look at the fossil record. The other thing you got to be aware of with the fossil record is non-genetic differences. These are differences in the life histories of an individual. So this is an example of a starfish down here, which at some point in its life sustained some damage on two of its arms. And you can see that it started to regrow those arms a little bit, but obviously those are things that happen to the individual. So these include things like pathologies or injuries. And those can actually affect the, uh, it's not a new species and not genetic difference, it's actually a difference in the lifespan of that particular individual. So for example, this starfish, if you found it in the fossil record, you wouldn't necessarily instantly recognize it as some aberrant, weird individual. It actually just had an injury. And so this is something to be aware of. The fossil record also is problematic in a number of ways in terms of distortion of fossils. So fossils basically represent this um, incredible process of fossilization. Oftentimes these fossils are under enormous amounts of pressure when they're formed deep underground. And so oftentimes they will flatten and get distorted. Um, they are re the minerals are replaced in the fossil to turn them into rock. All sorts of things can happen to the fossils that may, in fact, reflect the measurements as you're measuring a specimen. If you're looking at specimens that have bilateral symmetry, sometimes you can sort of adjust for that, knowing that one side is probably similar to the other side if you have some distortion. But distortion is a big problem, especially when you're dealing with uh, specimens that are very three-dimensional. You can also get information loss through breakage, um, so if the specimen is broken, or damaged, it makes it difficult to measure, and sometimes you always have to throw out the specimens that are not perfect, and it makes your sample sizes very small when you're working with a population and you're trying to you know, make lots of measurements and make sure that the measurements are accurate between each of the individual samples that you're measuring. So now let's kind of think about what a population would kind of look like, and to do that we're going to look at something called a survivorship curve. So this is a um, graph here that is a graph showing how many individuals in a population make it each year, survive each year. In this curve, we're, we have a 90% mortality per year. That means that 90% of the individuals die every year. So the first year, at time zero actually, um, we have 1,000 individuals in the population. By age one, 90% of those have died. And now we're left with only 100 individuals in the population. Another year elapsed, so we're at two years, 90% have died that year. We're down to only 10 individuals. Another year, year three, 
occurs, and we're down to one individual. So many species, many organisms, have population dynamics that are kind of like this. There's lots and lots of young babies. Think of dandelion seeds that are produced, millions of them. But then only a handful actually get out to three years and survive that long. So survival ship curves are really fascinating because that gives us a little sense of how many of these individuals in the population are surviving, especially surviving to sexual maturity. Now in paleontology, we should see a distribution like A, where we have tons and tons of little guys and very few of the older individuals. But if you were to do this with lots of fossil specimens, you actually see distributions that are more like B, a normal distribution. There's sort of a size that has a, you know, the optimal size there, and then sort of lags. Don't have very many little ones. We don't have any one really giant ones. We don't have a whole bunch of babies, and we don't have a whole bunch of older individuals. We have kind of the mean age. And one of the reasons why this is, is that those little guys that are produced don't make it in the fossil record. So they're teeny, they're small, they get broken up, they just don't enter into the fossil record as much as the larger individuals that are disproportionately represented in our population sample. So we can kind of look at this. So this is looking at um, a bivalve uh, gene or species, Cardium elida, and looking at different types of survival ship curves and looking at different populations. So one of the things that we can kind of play around with is try to figure out what the survivorship curve might have been like um, based on our samples. So for example, in this case two, um, where we take a bunch of them and we just measure them and use the length uh, there uh, to get at the age, we can sort of put, stack them up each individual of the sample into how old they are. And so in this case, we get a survival ship curve that looks a little bit more like um, two. If we have a survival ship curve that looks a little bit more like three, meaning there, there's a lot more of the little individuals, the little, the first year um, bivalves that survive, and then we'll get a, a curve that looks a little bit more like D there in case three. So. Um, what this is showing here is that you get lots of younger individuals um, that die before they reach um, a year old, whereas in this other case here, you, most of these actually make it to, to year two, um, and then you have a lot of mortality afterwards, and so this is more of a normal distribution. And this is reflected in this curve of three here, where a lot of them actually survive into sort of like to the second year, um, and we don't see the really sharp survival ship curve, like 90% mortality every year, and that would be something like one, where you know most of them die after the first year. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how you go about describing this variation in a bunch of fossils that you've collected. So we can look at variation within assemblages, and we can also look at variation between assemblages. So one of the things you might be interested in is within an assemblage of fossils that you've collected, uh, do you have two distinct populations that are different? They're morphologically different based on these sizes. Or one of the things you can do is say you have a collection of fossils that you've collected from one strata, and you're interested in comparing those fossils from that strata with ones that were collected somewhere else maybe at a higher horizon in the same formation, or maybe in a different geographic area. So maybe you want to compare Utah fossils with fossils collected in Wyoming of the same type, and you want to see if there's any sort of differences in your samples. So let's talk a little bit about how you actually set about doing this study. So one of the things you can do is what's called a univariate analysis, and that's where you just take one dimension that you measure. So um, in this example is width, and then you just count the number of specimens in your sample at those widths. Oftentimes what you can do is just you know, measure the samples with a, um, each fossil with the calipers and get a number, put it down, so the width. So you measure every single width of all, every single fossil that you find in your sample, in your population, and then you get sort of a distribution. So you can throw that as a histogram uh, is usually how it's depicted.
The other thing you can do is a bivariant analysis. That's where you look at two dimensions. So this would be, for example, looking at an area or a ratio. So you might be looking at the width and length of a shell. And so in that case, you're looking at the area. So you're looking at a box. And that's a bivariant analysis because you're looking at two measurements and combining those into a ratio. The other thing you can do is a multivariate analysis. This is where you look at more than just two measurements. So uh, multiple dimensions, it might be links between landmarks. Uh, you could go, go to three different measurements, so x, y, z, um, and plot those. So to plot those, you have to kind of think of it being plotted in three dimensions, those, those uh, spaces. But multivariate analysis is very popular, especially if you're doing um, scanning or making lots of points on your fossils and measuring those points. Now, one of the things you have to be kind of aware of when you're doing this is to be very careful of what you're actually measuring, because this can lead to some mistakes. So in this example here, we are measuring one, so this is a univariate analysis. We're measuring one parameter, that is width. And you can look, I kind of just put some little brachiopods there. Uh, so in the first sample A, uh, these fossils are narrower. So all of these guys are narrow with a mean of about 14.1. And B, you can look at those brachiopods. Those are wider. So they're wider, so they have a mean of 18.7. So they're, they're bigger. So if we compare these two measurements, we can see that the ones in the B graph are larger, or wider, I should say and the ones in A are narrower. So we could distinguish between these two. However, let's look if we do a bivariant analysis. We look at two types of dimensions. So in this case, we're looking at width and length divided by length and width divided by length. So one of the things you should notice is that uh, the fossils in A, even though they're narrower, they're kind of taller. They have a longer length. And the ones in B, even though they're wider, they're kind of shorter. They have a shorter length. And so if you do those two and you look at the ratio, so now you're just looking at the area. Even though the shape is different, the area is the same. So compare the means now. So in the brachiopods that are depicted in graph A, the mean is 1.26. And the brachiopods that are depicted in graph B are 1.24. Very close. So if you're looking at these two measurements and trying to compare this measurement, the, the ratio between these two, the width and the length, you're going to have a tough time. They'll look identical. So by doing those two measurements, you're not going to be able to distinguish between you know, the brachiopod that's wider and the brachiopod that's narrower. So be careful of what you look at in terms of measuring things. All right, so now I'm going to introduce um, a cool tool that you can use, some statistical tools in paleontology uh, when you're working with a population of fossils that you're taking lots of measurements. One of the rules that's kind of out there is that you must be about 95% sure that the differences between the two means mean something. And so the probability that your distribution was caused by chance is oftentimes what's referred to as the p-value. And that p-value must be lower than 0.05 to be considered significant. Now, a lot of people debate about the 0.05. You know, if you're right on the cusp, whether it's significant or not significant. Most of the time when you do these analyses, they are either way very significant or they're not significant at all. And usually that 0.05, <clears throat> you may approach it depending on how close. And then you just kind of have to you know, look at sort of how confident you can be. This is a technique um, that's called the student t-test. And I'm going to go through and talk a little bit about it. But before I do that, I got to talk a little bit about how the student t-test came about. Because it's a great story. And it has to deal with beer, and in particular, Guinness. So Guinness was being brewed in Ireland. And there was a brewer named William Gossett. Now, William Gossett was a brewer, but he he had a passion for statistics and, and math. Now, what William Gossett was doing was that he would test the beer, but he couldn't drink a lot of the beer because if he drank it, he'd be ruining his product. And he only could take samples, just a, a few samples. And what he was interested in is if he changed something, so if he changed the type of yeast that he used or he made some adjustment in the recipe, how that would affect the beer later on. And so he would take a bunch of samples 
of the beer at point A, and then he'd make the adjustment, and then he'd take a bunch of samples at time B, and he wanted to figure out how, how that, how, whatever he did, how did that affect something, and he wanted to figure it out mathematically. So um, he sat down and, and came up with a method of doing this. Now, William Gossett worked at Guinness, and he had to sign a agreement with the company, which is very common when you work with a private company, and that is that he wouldn't publish any of his secrets, any of the trade secrets, right? So he had developed this technique. He went to them and he said, hey, can I publish it, but I will publish it under a pseudonym. I'll be called student. And so he published his papers with the name student. That was all that appeared in the scientific papers they published on the statistics of using this technique, and hence it's become the student t-test. So before I begin with the student t-test, I want to define a term that you may be familiar with, and that is standard deviation. So standard deviation is basically um, a number that you come up with in a sample. So the mean is the average, which is basically you add up all your numbers and you divide by the number of samples. So if you have seven fossils, you add up all seven fossil measurements, divide by seven, and you get the mean. Standard deviation is how much of the sample is um, above and below that mean. And so a standard deviation of one basically means that you have 34.1% um, between zero and one standard deviation, and 34.1% between zero and um, minus the standard deviation. So if you have a standard deviation of two, for example, and your mean is eight, then you know 34.1% of your samples will be between you know eight and ten, and 34.1% will be between the eight and um, six. So you have standard deviation of two. So that's how you actually apply that. So standard deviations can tell you how sort of, um, sort of tall and skinny or wide and fat your distribution is when you look at a normal bell-shaped distribution. So that's standard deviation. It's pretty easy to calculate that in a spreadsheet. So let's look at an example of using a, a student t-test uh, with some fossils here. Here we have our, our fossils of brachiopods. And here I've actually looked at the width. Um, so here we have um, the width that I've listed on each one of these. And we have, oh, what, seven specimens here of the width of, of one population, Gracilis, and the width of another one, Natus. And we basically can calculate the mean for each one of those. The mean of the Gracilis gracilis is 18.7, and the standard deviation is 2.42. And the Gracilis natus, uh, the mean is 14.1, and the standard deviation is 1.34. So when we run the student t-test, it will generate a 95% confidence of those widths. So what we can do is we can say with 95% confidence that specimens that we find in this population that are between 17.06 and 20.31 is gracilis. We can be 95.95% confident that widths that are 12.53 and 15.77 are not us. If they're in between there, there's a big kind of range in there, right? So, you know, if we found a specimen that had a width of 16, we wouldn't be able to tell whether they're gracilis gracilis or gracilis natus. So you can see that in this overlap of the chart. So if you know you're out 16, there's quite a bit of overlap here. And we're not, we can't be certain. But if you found a specimen that was 20, you can be certain that it's gracilis gracilis. If you found a specimen down here that's 12, you'd be confident that the specimen is gracilis natus. See how that works. So let me show you a little bit about how you can use this technique in, in Excel. Um, and how you can do a student t-test. Um, so what you want to do is uh, list out your measurements. So in this case, we have two samples, fossil one and fossil two here. And we've taken a bunch of measurements. This might be width of the fossil, length, any measurement that we can put in there. And we want to compare these two. So we're going to do a student t-test. Now realize that the result of our student t-test is going to be a number. And that number is going to be, if it's less than 
then we have different populations with very little overlap. If that number is greater than 0 0.05, then we have the same population, and there's a great deal of overlap between the two. So I'll show you how to do it. So one of the things you want to do if you're using Excel, uh, the more recent versions of Excel now have a lot of these formulas, uh, statistical formulas built into Excel, which is great. You don't have to program it. So go to Formula, go down to More Functions, and go to Statistical. And there's all these wonderful uh, ones. You can actually do um, standard deviation if you're interested in that. And just go down to uh, Student T-Test right there. And actually, if you highlight it, you can see that this is going to be um, returns the probability associated with the student's t-test. So we're going to click on that, and that brings up this window. And the window here now is going to ask us the two arrays. That's the two series of um, specimens that we measured. Now, they don't necessarily need to be the same amount. So for example, we might have like 1,000 specimens of fossil 1 and 10 of fossil 2. Um, but we want to have, um, you know, pretty even uh, populations that will help us to distinguish the two, but they don't have to be the same number. So in array one, we're just going to highlight all the specimens in that first column. In array two, we're going to highlight all the specimens that we measured of the second type. With tail, we're going to do two tail. So that means that it's going to be a normal distribution with two tails. And then the type here, um, so if you are doing what um, Gazette did when he was testing beer, you would want to pair. So each one of these may have um, some sort of pairing. If you're comparing populations, you don't need to pair these two samples. So example of a pairing might be if you took a sample at time one, and then you sampled the same vat at time two. It's the same vat, and so you want to compare those. So the, the order that you list those um, specimens or those measurements that you made uh, matter. So in this case, we don't care. So we're just going to say it's basically um, paired as 1 is 2. Okay. So we do that, and we get a number. So this first one, we get a number that's actually very low. In fact, it's um, you see the e minus 0, 06. So that's in scientific notation. Uh, so that means that there's six zeros <laughs> before we get to that 1. Um, and then it's zero, what, zero, like zero 0.05. So that's a really small number, which means that the two samples are significantly different by 95% confidence. Uh, let's look at the next sample here. Um, and we can run the same test. We go up to statistics, go here. We jump down to our student t-test, right down there. Click on that. Our first array is this group. We have less samples on this, less fossils. And we have the second group. Uh, we're going to do two, and we're going to do two. And we get a number. And this number is much, much larger. It's uh, 0 0.579584, which is much greater than 0 0.05. So it's the same population. There's very much a lot of overlap in these two samples. And so there's no difference between these two samples, these two populations that we're looking at in terms of this measurement that we've, that we've taken. So that's how you do a student t-test in, um, in Excel. Um, there's actually some wonderful things online as well you can do with student t-tests and run these. Now, the student t-test is designed for small sample sizes, um, which is perfect for um, paleontology when we're dealing with very small samples. So now let's talk a little bit about um, multivariate analysis. And this is where you're using lots, comparing lots of measurements. Um, so here's an example of a gastropod shell. Um, you know, you can make a lot of measurements, right? So you don't necessarily need to look at the length of the fossil. You can compare the length to the width, and you can put all of these measurements into a computer and conduct a multivariate analysis. And I talked a little bit about principal component analyses, and that's where you basically take all those measurements and you look for the measurements that reflect the most amount of variation in all the measurements that you, that you measured. And then you rank each of those measurements. So say the ratio between the shell length versus the shell width saw the most amount of variation. That could be one of your principal components. And then you can compare that maybe to the second principal component, which might be the aperture width and the aperture height. 
for example, on this gastropod. So taking those measurements, you can compare them and pull things apart and look for how they differ from populations. And this is actually a great way of distinguishing different types of fossils from one another to see how they differ from each other in a population. So um, it's a great technique using multivariate analysis. A little bit more complicated than the simple sort of bivariate and univariate analysis that we've done so far. So thanks for watching. If you're interested in taking a course of paleontology at Utah State University, check out the web department website at geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in who I am and the research I do, check out my website at benjaminslashberger.org. Thank you for watching. Take care.